Hi, my name is Dr. Sai Chavoshi, and I'm delighted that you can join us today to review a workshop we do every year to prepare the students in the Toronto School Boards for the transition to university. This transition has, of course, become more difficult due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've been delivering this workshop online to make sure that we are able to reach as many students as who could benefit from it. To make this easier for you to navigate, we have included a table of contents and you can jump to the section that is most relevant to you. In a moment, I'll be introducing my colleagues, Dr. Kevin Nobo and Dr. Eduardo Rolden, who alongside myself will be presenting the workshop to you. There are also slides and a resource guide available for download. The link will be included below. I hope you enjoy this presentation. I want to thank everyone for joining us today on an informative and hopefully interesting presentation on how to get ready for your post-secondary studies. Um, we're going to get started shortly. Uh, I'll take the moment now to introduce the panel. Um, we're thrilled here today to have uh, three amazing colleagues who uh, have presented this last year too. So if you were around, you may have seen us doing this presentation for some of your classrooms. This year, again, because of COVID, we are able to present this remotely and hopefully to more students. So again, welcome. Um, as students are slowly rolling in, um, I will open up our presentation by introducing you to my colleagues. Um, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Eduardo Rolden. Um, Dr. Rolden, at various points, has actually trained and supervised both myself and Dr. Noble, who is another colleague presenting today. So he is a, not only a wealth of information, but an amazing mentor. He's a clinical and school psychologist, and he completed his PhD at Lakehead University and trained at various uh, mental health institutions across the province and in Toronto. Um, Dr. Rolden is also the director of the Tobacco Psychological Services, and for the past four years has been training emerging psychologists like myself and Dr. Noble. So it's a pleasure to have you uh, on the panel, of the Dr. Rolden. Thank you. Next up, uh, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Dr. Saeed Chavoshi, and uh, I'm a clinical and school psychologist. Have a passion for time management and study skills. That was a topic I did my dissertation on. And every year, alongside my colleagues, I have been presenting this workshop for students who want to have a head start when it comes to getting ready for college and university. So we are thrilled to have you here. As a clinical psychologist, I have also trained at various mental health institutions in the city, and I'm also the director of the Psychoed Clinic in Midtown Toronto. I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Kevin Noble. Um, Dr. Noble is a clinical and school psychologist, and uh, he did his studies at Guelph University, where as part of his research, he did a fair bit of work with students with learning disabilities and their journey and success at university. So we are thrilled to have Dr. Noble presenting to us today on special services and considerations for students who are going to college and university with learning disabilities, ADHD, and other situations knowing how to take advantage of all the services and accommodations that are available to them to have a fantastic start in their post-secondary journey. So on that note, I'm going to just give you a quick rundown on what the day was going to look like. We'll start by talking about the impact of COVID-19. It's been over a year and it's affected every aspect of our lives and it has affected every aspect of your life, I'm sure too. We'll talk about how COVID-19 is affecting not only the disruptions in our lives, but also our mental health and well-being, and how that's important to notice as we prepare for post-secondary studies. We'll talk about how to get ready for university, what to expect when you start going to college or university, and a, a fair number of learning tips that's going to help you be the best student you can be. Lastly, we'll talk about learning disabilities, accessibility services, and how to get the support you need once you're at university. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Ed Rolden. About that, thank you so much, Dr. Shavoshi. Um, you know, uh, we, I'm very excited to be here today, and I just wanted to start off by by mentioning that the three of us are actually uh, members of the Toronto uh, of the uh, Psychology Department here at the TCDSB. And one of the things that we're hoping to do through our discussion is sort of give you a little bit of information that. 
um, is going to help you, as Dr. Shaboshi said, transition. This is such a huge transition point. Um, this is a, an exciting and yet also, I imagine, for some individuals, an anxiety-provoking transition. Um, and that's true of, of this transition at any point in time. Now, imagine you guys are doing this uh, during a pandemic. The first class to have to actually go through their graduating year during a pandemic. And it's, it's interesting because Dr. Shavoshi mentioned this, but we did this presentation last year to the graduating class uh, that had sort of first experienced this pandemic. And it's crazy for me to think that here we are a year later and we're having the same discussion in many ways. And so uh, I wanted to make sure we started off by talking a little bit about, um, you know, putting words to your experience. You know, nothing that I'm going to say is going to be necessarily new to you because you as, as the graduating class has experienced what COVID-19 has done to your graduating year. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what the statistics have been showing in terms of the impact of COVID-19. And so there was a study that was done uh, of 3,100 um, Ontario high school students. And uh, what they did was they, they tried to examine the impact of the first wave. This is at the beginning of, of, the, of the pandemic. And what they found was that many students had uh, increases in, in a sense of boredom loneliness, stress and anxiety were increasing. Uh, most individuals reported that they were spending a lot more time, makes sense, online, right? Whether they're watching you know, movies, TV, playing video games, surfing the internet, um, and also uh, much of their communication uh, with peers was occurring online, which makes sense, again, given that all the closures that were occurring. Um, we're also, you know, the last one's a big, is a, a last stat there on this on the slide is you know, also almost half of, of you guys reported an increase in sleeping patterns. So you're sleeping more. Imagine, you know, a lot of the youth that we work with are describing just like sometimes being bored, not having much to do, uh, waking up later, the demands are decreased. Um, and so you, you can imagine how, how, you know, you again, you guys have experienced how COVID has changed your world. Um, and so the interesting part about the first part of, of, the, of the pandemic is that during that period, as people were describing more experiences of boredom and loneliness and stress and anxiety, um, there was only a, about 4% uh, of individuals, sorry, the slide is not working. So do you have control over it right now? For some reason, I'm not able to change it. There we go. So having said all those, uh, discussed all those changes in terms of increase of stress and anxiety, only 4% of students were actually seeking mental health supports. And so part of this discussion is to talk to you a little bit about how that conversation about the impact of COVID-19 is something that we're gonna really encourage, right? If parents are out there in the audience as well, the message that I'm gonna give you is about having an you know, giving your, ch your child an invitation to have these conversations. Many times we, we're afraid to talk about certain things or whether it's us as youth who, who maybe are nervous or don't want to admit to some of the struggles that we're having. As a parent, maybe you're afraid that the, your, your child is going to respond in a certain way. And obviously one of the takeaways that we're going to try to, to promote is the idea of having an open and, and honest conversation about we're all, what we're all experiencing. And so, you know, just this week, you guys probably, you know, I think yesterday the uh, Toronto Star was running an article on this idea of code pink. And, the, and the, uh, uh, this code pink came out of data from the Ch uh, Children First Canada. Uh, it's, a, it's a nonprofit organization that did a survey about the, third, the impact of the third wave on, on uh, youth. And what they found was there, there's been a drastic change in terms of substance use disorders, uh, suicide attempt admissions, ER visits to, uh, due to mental health. 70% of youth reported that the pandemic has harmed their mental health. So think about that, how staggering that is. Seven out of 10 kids are reporting that their mental health has is, is been impacted in a negative manner due to pandemic. It makes sense, but it's, it's still staggering to see those numbers. And if you look at Stats Canada information, uh, that the age group that you guys fall into, the 15 to 24, reported the greatest decline in mental health overall. It's about 20 points um, during the pandemic. And so, Okay, so again, I'm making, you know, I'm saying things that you guys are experiencing. So, so what first question that I that we may want to wonder is uh, may want to ask or, or talk about is why is this happening? Why is our mental health being compromised? Well, you know, it's 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 interesting, right? When you know, the three of us all work in, in private practice, and all the three of us also work with youth uh, for the most part. Um, and one of the things that was interesting to me as when I'm working with youth is that I've seen a big difference between the individuals during the first uh, first part of the pandemic and the and the latter part of the pan pandemic. In some ways, the first part was difficult at first, but as we went into this into the warmer months. Uh, 
kids started to sort of enjoy that they weren't at school. You know, there were still some social outings that we could do. And then during this last uh, closure, I felt that kids started to feel the brunt of, of the pandemic a little bit more. It was just getting more tiring. It was more like, are we still doing this? You know, in, in other, the, all these emotions of like, of maybe some frustration or anger, you could see in, in, in our community that it's starting to rise a, a lot more now. And so if you think about, you know, why is this pandemic sort of impacting our mental health? I think it's important to recognize sort of three main, main components. The first is, um, you know, oftentimes when we're afraid of something, something makes us anxious, it's something very specific. You know, if it's a young child, it might be the dark. It might be strangers. As you get into teenage, in your teenage years, a lot of the stressors are related to social like, what are people going to think of me? What if I make a mistake? What if I, I make a fool out of, myself, out of myself? And yet with the pandemic, it's something that is looming. It's there. It's, it's there, but it's not there, right? We, every time we go outside, we're reminded of all the things that have been sort of taken away from us. Just this idea of like going into a store, you're putting on a mask. You're, you're not able to talk to people as you, as you used to. You're not able to do any of your, your, your sports or, or all those things. So, you know, it's this looming sort of um, danger that's out there. And whenever something is, is, is looming or, or everywhere, it can tire our system out, right? Our, our basically what ends up happening is we're in a state of stress throughout the, throughout the experience of the pandemic. So you can imagine why that starts to drain the system. The second point is again related to this idea uh, that we've lost things that we uh, get, that give us a sense of mastery or that give us a sense of control. This might be the things that you really enjoy doing, the hobbies, those like, social activities that we're used to doing, hanging out at the park with your friends, going to the mall, eating, you know, uh, going to the food court. Um, those are all these things that you know have been sort of taken away from us. Um, and then the last one is this idea that you know we always have stressors. And yet the pandemic has now magnified some of these stressors. So think about the idea of the financial stressors. You know, do people, are people, are your parents going to continue to be able to have a job? Um, you know, where kids are feeling isolated. And so you can imagine how this starts to compound. And so this, I like this visual just because it's just throwing all these things. This is sort of our reality for you guys right now. It's like college, university, acceptance, uh, what's it going to be like? What's first year going to be like? Uh, how do I make friends during the pandemic? What if I don't know anybody? Uh, what are these classes going to be like? Is, are they going to be virtual? Can I learn in that environment? I struggled in, in grade 12. How am I going to sort of proceed in, in, in college university? Um, and so in many ways, I, 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 like to, I like to think about this idea of the analogy of the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, because in many ways, it's not a big thing that causes something to fall apart. It's the accumulation of things. And so if you think of all these things, you know, again, I, I go back to what I said earlier. This transition point is a huge uh, uh, accomplishment for you guys and for all, anybody that goes through it. It's a, it's a big deal. And it, with, it, with a big accomplishment, there's always stressors. So there's always going to be some weight on your shoulders. And what we've done or what you guys have had to experience is that normal transition period with all of its stressors, in addition to all the added weight of being of, of, of it occurring during a pandemic. And so in many ways, um, this idea of having that chronic stress can turn into a sense of despair. You know, people talk about languishing. You look at, I don't know if you guys have seen articles, but there are people have been talking about a sense of languishing, a sense of despair that the population is describing. And in many ways, you know, what's interesting is that when we feel despair, there is a, um, an adaptive quality to it. If you think from an, a biological organism, whenever it's, it's um, faced with uh, insurmountable odds, sometimes the body starts to shut down so that it can recoup some energy and sort of bounce back when it has an opportunity. And I'd like to sort of propose the same thing for us psychologically. Sometimes when we're being bombarded by so many stressors, we can feel like we're shutting down. But in many ways, I would encourage you to look at it as, this is an opportunity to start rebuilding and be ready for that time when society starts to open up again. Um, okay. Sorry, say it again. I don't know if you can change the... I'm having trouble switching. There we go. And so just quickly, because I don't, I don't want to take too much uh, of... of of Dr. Shavoshi's section, but I think it's important to recognize what's happening. You guys are experiencing an interri interrupted rite of passage. This transition point is supposed to be that point at which you're leaving sort of childhood and adolescence and into adulthood. And so 
you guys in, as a graduating class during the pandemic has been robbed of some of those experiences, right? So some of those milestones, um, the things that maybe you had been looking forward to since you started high school for anybody who was in sports and was looking for their senior, looking forward to their senior year, or if you were in some sort of in, in music or a performance, uh, uh, you know, if you performed in some way, again, you were building up to that graduating year and that has been sort of taken away from you. And so you can imagine again, that that is, um, you know, going to be a stressor for, for anybody. So you can you change the slide, please. Uh, Dennis, I think you have control. For some reason, I'm not. Uh, yeah. So this is what I was just talking about, this idea that that uh, uh, there's been a disruption in milestones. Um, and, and I think the key here is to acknowledge how you feel about it. Let's talk about how difficult this has been. Let's talk about the things that, that has, have been taken away from you. Because in many ways, what you guys are experiencing is a sense, is, is a sort of, of, of grief, right? Like what is grief, but a loss of something meaningful and something, uh, you know, and sometimes it's unexpected. And, and grief is a difficult sort of experience and emotion that we all go through. And so I think one of the first things that I'm going to say to you guys as a unit, whether it's families or as individuals, is to acknowledge, and I, unfortunately I can't switch the slide, but um, it, it would say the first step thing that I'm going to ask you and encourage you to do is to acknowledge what's happening. Let's talk about it. Name what is occurring. You know, I'm going through grief. I'm going through loss. I'm going through a difficult and challenging moment. And I think it's important to recognize that as we experience something like grief, there is no right, right way or wrong way to experience it. There's going to be, you know, a mix of emotions. At times you might feel angry. Like, how was this taken away from me? Sometimes maybe it's guilt. Like, oh, you know, I didn't wear the, my mask that time. Maybe I should have. Or sadness. I can't believe, again, I'm, I'm sad. I'm, I'm, I feel isolated, lonely, heartbreak. Um, and in many ways, um, and, and, so, and so I think it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, and, and I think it's also important to acknowledge that it can also uh, change from moment to moment. So you, one day you might be feeling okay, and another day you might be feeling, you know, not so okay, and, and, and it can get more intense in, in other direction as well. Um, so again, let's talk about this. Any parents in the audience and for, for the youth that are out there, what's the first thing? The first thing I'm, we're going to encourage you to do is validate. Acknowledge and validate. Let's, let's, let's talk about that experience that you're, you're having and free yourself to have the experience that occurs. If you're feeling angry, you know what? Anger tells you that something needs to change. There's a purpose to the, every emotion that we feel. And so if you're feeling something, I want you to encourage, I encourage you to validate for yourself, but also for the kid, your kids, um, so that they can, they can start to acknowledge and be open to some of the experiences and emotions that they're having in, in response to the pandemic. Also make room for uncomfortable feelings. We're so good in society at turning away and pushing away things that are challenging. And in many ways, by doing that, we don't end up sort of working through them. So I would encourage you to have these difficult conversations. And then the last step, I really like the last point here is about being kind to yourself. I think we can all sort of agree that from, in many ways, we can be our worst critic. I can say the worst things about myself and find my, my soft spots, the things that I'm sensitive about, and I can do it internally. And I, I imagine that a lot of you will experience the same thing. And I would say to you, in, when you're going through a difficult moment, it, I, to, I would encourage you to be kind to yourself. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, sort of making things up. It might be something as simply, you know, saying to yourself, man, this is hard. This is challenging. You know, I'm not, I, I hate that I'm going through this. That's, that's being kind to yourself. Um, Okay, so we've already, uh, again, just a couple of things here. I, I would try to uh, uh, resist the idea of minimizing or dismissing any reactions, right? Don't try to push them away. Don't try and put them under wherever, you know, and think that I'll, I'll just, you know, I won't think about it. I won't think about it. Anytime we don't, we, we tell ourselves, let's not think about something, it becomes bigger and it definitely comes back. And so we want to be open to, to, to acknowledging those things that we're experiencing. Um, and then just just some some final steps in terms of what you guys can do. You've seen these everywhere, so I don't want to spend too much time because you know one of them is stay connected. If 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 one of the things you can do is we talk about you know social distancing. I'm sorry, physical distancing, not social distancing. So if you have those connections, I would really encourage you guys to reach out. If you've stopped talking to, to other peers, I would encourage you to to reach out anyways. Even if you think oh that's going to be weird, I haven't messaged them in months. Do it. You know, try and connect. Try to see if there's groups for the 
the, the college or university you're going to. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I really to do your best to, to connect with others. Focus on the things that you can control. So think about how you may finally be able to celebrate your graduation. Think about the things you may be able to do once the pandemic sort of you know eases up and we can go back to more more normal life. And then and then finally, you know, emphasize you know they put an emphasis on some of the contributions that you guys have been doing for the better good. You guys have you know uh, followed rules and done things what society is asking you to do, and in many ways that is restricted from some you from some of the things you could experience. So acknowledge the role you've been playing and acknowledge the fact that there may be some frustration and annoyance based on the fact that we're still in this pandemic a year later. And and um, so again, acknowledging and give yourself space for those uh, experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roldan. And let's talk about as you go through acknowledging the disruptions you've had, acknowledging the changes you face, how do you get ready for university? And usually there's an orientation week at the start of your university or college career. This year, because of COVID, this has been disrupted somewhat. Last year, most institutions had moved their orientation to um, online. We reached out as part of this webinar to all the institutions we could in Ontario to see um, how they are structuring their orientation moving forward. And it is the case that most institutions um, are moving to an online orientation for fall. However, there will be in-person events, smaller gatherings permitted. Um, when it comes to orientation, it's your first chance to learn about your institution. It's your first chance to get a feel of what are the rules, what are the opportunities, what are the social aspects of your institution that you can enjoy. And I have one rule when it comes to success, and that is to show up. Showing up can be difficult, especially if it's online. It can seem like it's unnecessary, redundant, another Zoom meeting. You've had hundreds of those, but it matters. Showing up matters because you never know what you could come across, whether a piece of information, whether a connection, a friend who's going to be there in all your classes that you wouldn't have met otherwise. So rule number one, no matter how orientation is going to be at your institution, and based on what the institutions are saying right now, it's online, still show up. There will be opportunities for in-person events as the year progresses, show up to those do. And it's okay if you're having anxiety about showing up or if you have accessibility needs, whether um, sensory issues or any uh, accessibility needs that may prevent you from showing up, these institutions have built in services for that. So if you contact a FROSH leader or your uh, specific orientation program leader, they will make sure that you have what it takes for you to show up. A question I often get from students is how will classes look like in September? I feel like that's a million dollar question. What will it look like in September? Will the pandemic be over? Will we finally go back to normal? And the answer is it's still uncertain. I know that's an uncomfortable answer because we wanna know what we're working towards. We contacted most institutions and I have the information up for the ones in the GTA. Most are planning for a hybrid return in September and a full return in the winter term. So what that means is that some of the institutions are planning for upwards of 50% capacity for the September classes, holding some of those smaller classes in person and moving the larger ones online. What that means for you as a first year student is that most of your classes will be online because there are larger classes. However, there will be opportunities for you to be on campus and take advantage of those opportunities. Again, remember, show up. It's the number one rule when it comes to having a successful transition to university or college. Now, these plans are being updated as we move forward. And all the major universities have committed to having a solid plan by the end of June, giving students about 90 days before September to figure out how they're going to proceed. Having said that, as of now, being optimistic, it looks like you will be able to physically show up on campus if you choose to. And if you choose to continue in remote learning, you are able to take most of the classes you need, if not all of them, remotely. So what do you do once you start university? At first, it's exciting. There's going to be a honeymoon stage. Then you may experience some challenges, and that's normal. 
I've worked with hundreds of university students and I was a psychologist at York University Student Counseling Services where I would do therapy with many students who are experiencing challenges. It is fairly common to experience challenges such as low mood, such as anxiety when you are in university. And there are many services available for you. The first service that is the one that perhaps you should consider uh, most immediately is the counseling services on campus. All major universities have accessibility and counseling services where you can meet with therapists, psychologists, social workers who will talk to you and help you navigate the challenges that you're facing. There's also provincial wide programs that are available to you regardless of which institution, college or university you attend. Um, the one that's available to all the students is called Good to Talk. It is a phone line where you can call and talk to a trained professional to discuss what are the challenges you're facing, talk about ideas of how to improve and where you can get farther help. So remember that when you start university, after the excitement wears off, it is okay to experience stress. And if the stress becomes overwhelming or if you feel like you need help, reach out. There is help available. What are some things you can do when you're at university to make sure that your mood and your mental health is as well taken care of as your studies? Well, physical exercise is one of the best ways we know of how to take care of our mood. Make sure you stay active. It's easy to fall into the routine of just studying and staying in your room. It's important to engage in exercise. Maintaining a good sleep routine. It's again easy, especially when you're doing online learning to stay up till the <laughs> 4 or 5 a.m. till the wee hours of the morning and then um, again, have a disrupted sleep in the afternoon. Being able to get a good night's sleep is not only important for your mood and mental health, it also helps with your learning because our brain consolidates information during sleep. And lastly, remember that there are various exercises, these are psychology exercises available to you um, as a free app that you can get that really help you cope with your stresses. These are tools for stress management and they often involve an active exercise component, such as deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation. One of my favorite apps that can teach you these tools is the UCLA Mindfulness app. It's a free service developed by psychologists that teaches you why these things help you and walks you through as you learn to do them. Now, like most things, doing it once is not going to help you. These are kinds of tools that you have to engage in routinely before they become productive, and they do become productive and helpful. There's a ton of research that shows engaging a daily ritual or a daily practice of whether it's deep breathing, stress reduction, meditation, helps you have not only better mood, but manage the stressors that life throws at you. So download one of these apps and give them a try. You have nothing to lose. Remember we talked about exercise. There's a lot of campus institutions and activities that you can join that not only help you be physically active, but socially active. I said I only had one rule for success, which was to show up. I'm going to add a second rule to that, which is to join. One of the best predictors of success when it comes to post-secondary transition is actually nothing to do with your grades or how hard you study, it's how involved you are. Research after research has shown that students who are involved on campus life, whether they join a club, a student group, an event, a sporting team, they are much more successful during their four years or five years at their post-secondary institution. And the reason for that is once we join things, we become more socially active and that has positive effects for our mood. Um, we make friendships. We have all the other reasons that keep us going when the studying gets tough. So rule number one, show up. Rule number two, join. Join an event or a student group or a sport team or a club when you finally reach university. And there'll be many opportunities for you to find what you can join. Most institutions have campus club fairs where early in fall, all the available clubs and student groups uh, put out booth and they invite you to join them. So when you have the opportunity to see one of these show up, even if it's virtual, so you get to know what are the social opportunities available to you on campus. All right, so I'm gonna take a moment now to pause before we jump into the next big section of today's webinar. And the section that uh, I'm hoping you walk away with, with a few tools that you can use. In this section, we're gonna talk about learning and we're gonna talk about learning about learning. So what does that mean? In psychology, you often call that meta learning. It's about learning techniques that help you become even a better student. So it's not memorizing 
calculus or history. It's about how do you actually memorize better? How do you read better? How do you learn better? And there's a lot of tools and topics out there that can help you be a better learner. And that itself is worth investigating. Many of us go through our high school and our university career never having been taught what are the best ways to learn? What are the best ways to take a test? What are the best ways to memorize a pile of information? So I want you to invite you to today's appetizer on this topic. There's a lot more out there and uh, I have more resources that not only will you get following this webinar, I'm putting together as a course that will be available to you during the summer. Collectively, these ideas help you not only learn any particular subject better, but become a better overall student. So let's dig into it. The first set of techniques we're gonna talk about are about managing your attention. Your attention is your most important currency during your university career. We're gonna talk about note-taking techniques, tools for better memorization, and active learning, which is the best way to study. All right, let's dig into this. I have some more resources that again will be available to at the end. And as part of my dissertation, when I was doing my PhD, I put these tools together to see whether they help students. And the research showed that they really help students do well, not only as they transition to university, but throughout their career. And they, only, they not only gain better grades, their mental health, their level of stress and depressive symptoms goes down when they have these tools. I have a set of videos that are available to you and we'll share them at the end of the presentation. And again, I want to bring your attention to the idea of learning about learning. So let's move forward with that. Many of you have already experienced a little bit how university and college is going to be different than high school, in that there's going to be less structure. Right now, as many of you are studying from home and joining this webinar from home, um, you are already in your own home environment and it's easy to uh, melt home and school life. Um, now, in university, there's even less structure. For example, no one's actually taking attendance to see that you're showing up to class. No one may be checking in on you to see if you're getting your homework done. And a lot more of the learning responsibilities are on your shoulder. So what do we do about that? It's important to separate the boundary between work and life, between leisure and study time. Those boundaries help us get into that zone where we can be productive and focus and pay attention. Um, if you are studying at home, it's important to change your environment, to signal to yourself, to your brain that this is learning time, this is school time. If you're sitting with your pajamas in bed and trying to read a book, that may not be the best way to study. I often tell students, it's really good to divide leisure and school. So maybe have a table where you go to study, that's your school table, and have another environment, whether it's a corner of your room or in your bed or anywhere else where you do anything but study. Maintaining clear boundaries between work and personal time is not only critical to studying and learning, it's also important for your health. Oftentimes we can, can become overly stressed when we combine work and school. So we never feel like we're done school or done work. But we're always carrying this baggage of tasks and to-do lists over your shoulder. So how do we separate this boundary when COVID and remote learning has made it so easy to mix the two up? There are two things we can do, using space and using time. When it comes to space, you literally can have a different table or a different laptop or an iPad dedicated to school and a different environment dedicated to um, leisure, to playing games, to hanging out with friends. Better yet, dedicate a desk to studying and play outside. Go get some fresh air. When it comes to time, it's important to block off your study times, preferably around the same time every day, and have an actual timetable, calendar up. So you know when your school starts or when your work period starts and when your leisure starts. So you know, let's say after 7 p.m. every day, you don't have to do any more school. It's your personal time. This is even more important at university because no one is doing it for you. You have to structure your own time. And one of the tools that makes students successful is being able to pre-plan their study time. So ahead of time, block in a couple of hours for each course a week where they go to study. And what helps is to actually not only block off the time, but also write what you will be studying and where. What is the physical location where you'll be at? So a weekly study schedule may look like this, where you have your classes plotted in and the different chunks of time that you're going to spend for each class studying. 
This allows you to do two things. First, recognize when work is over so you can relax. Second, you can see how much time do you actually have. Oftentimes, we are a lot busier than we think we are. And once you put in all the hours where you have to spend for the different courses, especially at university and college, you'll notice that there's not a lot of spare time left. So you better make sure that you're not leaving all your readings or work pile up so that you have to cram before a midterm or an exam. All right, let's talk about active learning. We're gonna talk about three different sets of principles that will help you be a better learner. Now, again, this is an appetizer. There are many more tools out there and I'll share many of them with you both at the end of this webinar and through a course this summer. For now, I want you to get a sense of what it means to use learning strategies to become a better learner. Let's start by talking about attention, because that's one that you may not have considered before, and it's perhaps the most important thing we're going to talk about today. Managing your attention. There are so many things that pull us and tempt us to multitask. You know, you can be on your phone, you can be messaging someone while you have your book open and trying to study. Oftentimes, I see students in the classroom where they have one tab open, where they're looking at the lecture, and they have five more tabs open. Facebook, social media, email, news. As a university instructor, uh, I would often see students in the back of the lecture hall have many tabs open and not be able to focus. Now, why is this hard? Why is it hard to multitask? Because simply put, we can't. Our brain cannot multitask. We do not have the physical ability to multitask. When we are multitasking, what we are doing is quickly shifting our attention from one task to another. And every time we do this, there is a cost. A cost in terms of energy, accuracy, and most importantly, memory. Every time you're studying and you get a text, bing, and you check your phone, what was in your mind gets partially wiped because that information wasn't fully processed. So every disruption makes us a less efficient learner. Now, do we have a lot of disruptions? Yes, we do, and there's a lot of research showing that. This is an old research talking about how people check their phone 150 times a day. And that may sound to you like a lot, but a newer research study has shown that it's even more than that. In fact, some of the students, and myself to be honest, sometimes have the ghost phone phenomenon where I feel like it's in my pocket vibrating when it's even not. We all have this tendency to constantly check our phone. And especially if it's in our visual field, we can't ignore it. What that does is that our everyday life is often interrupted by a phone or a distraction on the phone roughly every five to 10 minutes. And those are a lot of distractions. Now imagine this distraction is happening when you're trying to focus on something important, effortful, that you want to remember for later. And there's a lot of popular research and articles on this that you can look into yourself. The fact that multitasking and these distractions prevent us from being an efficient learner. So you could be studying for hours, yet not retaining as much information. Now, it doesn't only affect you like secondhand smoke, multitasking and being distracted while you're trying to pay attention affects those around you. In a study in York University, they looked at uh, not only were you multitasking, but in your visual field, if you were sitting in a lecture and someone in front of you had their laptop open and they were watching a hockey game or they were on Facebook, would that affect your ability to study? And the results were amazingly yes. Just like noise pollution or secondhand smoke, if you're around people who are distracted, who are um, engaging in multitasking, when you are trying to pay attention, it's super easy to become distracted. In fact, we can't control it. Your brain automatically gravitates towards novel or new information or stimuli. So if you're sitting here and trying to look at the screen and you have flashing lights around you, your eyes will dart to those lights. And every time this happens, a piece of the information or much of the information that you were mulling in your head, that you were thinking about, gets lost. And so you have to redo that work, which is why multitasking results in a loss of energy. You feel more tired when you're engaging in multitasking. So as I said, when I was teaching in university and college, um, sometimes I would go to the back of the lecture and this is the scene I would see. Students would, some would be trying to pay attention, others would be on social media, others would be checking email, others would be on news. And this not only affected their own learning, but their neighbor's learning. How do we know this? <laughs> this is a group of students playing a computer game in one of my lectures. And this sort of thing does not allow you to be the best student you can be. Remember, we want to separate leisure time and learning time. So they did studies where they had students turn off their phone during lecture. 
and they remarkably did better in their studies. They also had studies where they would have students not have a laptop during lecture. Now I know for many of us that's no longer an option, but it brings to your attention how multitasking gets in your way because without a laptop, those students perform much better in their classes. Now, why is it that we're so addicted that we cannot override the impulse, the desire to check our phones, especially when the notification light is going on? It's because initially, every time you get a little notification and we check it, we get a small brain high. It gives you a sense of ooh, interest, joy, when you notice that someone's trying to contact you or you have a piece of news that's waiting for you. And so what happens after a while, this becomes addictive. So much so that if a student's phone is taken away from them, they start experiencing anxiety. They start feeling uncomfortable. I know many of us, if we leave our phone at home, even if you're halfway to our destination, we would go back and pick up our phone. It's now part of our body. Without it, we can't go anywhere. So it's important for us to manage it. It's unrealistic for me to say, just leave your phone at home when you're going to class. You're probably going to take it with you. What do we do to deal with that? Now remember, the strategy that's not good is trying to just use your willpower. The reason for that is our willpower is quite limited. So if you're trying to override it with your willpower constantly, you're using up a resource that's better put in other areas, such as trying to focus. In psychology, we call that ego depletion, which is the idea that when you repeatedly use your willpower in a short period of time, it gets depleted and it makes it more likely that you will give in to a temptation at the end of it. Um, so for example, most people break their diets not at 9 a.m. in the morning, they do it at night after a long day of having resisted the temptation to eat junk food. So what do you do? You're sitting at home, you're trying to be a good student and focus, and you have a, a cheerleader, uh, screaming notifications behind you. Check your email, check your messenger, check your WhatsApp. Oh, you just got a notification from a friend. You're missing out on something. And it's tough to resist that. So don't create barriers. And this is a topic in psychology that we use to help us arrive at the behavior we want when we are faced with many, many temptations, which is to not fight the temptations head on using your willpower all the time, engineer or design your environment so those temptations become less accessible. They become less within arm reach. So for example, when it comes to your physical environment, something as simply as putting the distraction out of sight can do wonders. What that means is if you take your phone and if you just lock it in your cabinet or put it in your bag and zip up your bag, you become much less likely to check your phone while you're doing your work. If you physically remove it to another location, so for example, for students who are trying to have a better night's sleep, I often tell them to have their phone on their desk or somewhere far away from their bed so it's not within an arm's reach so they don't get tempted to check it. Similarly, if you're trying to study in a library, make sure your phone is not on the desk face up, <laughs> looking at you, tempting you every second of the moment to check it. Um, if you don't need the internet, you can turn off your wireless connection. Just that extra step of having to turn it back on to check social media, creates an impediment, a behavioral barrier that makes it less likely that you go and waste time on social media when you're trying to study. A better technique is to even separate your fun device and your social media or your gaming device. So you can have a different location for when you go to study and a different location for when you go to uh, play. And you can have a different device for both. So if you have a laptop and a desktop at home, maybe set your desktop such that it only has educational or work material and use your laptop for, uh, or a tablet for playing games. You can also separate accounts. So if you only have one laptop or one tablet, that's great. Create two different accounts, call one the learning account. You can call the other one the leisure account. And make sure that in the learning account, you only have the tools you need for learning. Nothing that will distract you. In fact, you can add tools that will help you stay focused. Tools we call web blockers, which I'll tell you in a moment. Um, if you have more than one electronic device, make sure that the one you use for fun and the one you use for studying are separate. Now, I told you about web blockers. These are tools that you can install on your laptop that block your access to the internet or to a number of websites, such as social media websites, for an amount of time that you choose. So essentially, you're in the driver's seat, but you're deciding beforehand to not have that temptation. It's like deciding to lock up a muffin for an hour so you don't eat it right away. You can eat it later. In this case, you decide, okay, I don't want to have access to YouTube for an hour while I'm studying because I know I usually get distracted on YouTube or I usually get distracted on Facebook. 
So you can block that website for an amount of time that you choose. There are different web blockers. Here's a couple of my favorite ones, Freedom, Cold Turkey, Self-Control. And they all do something that's important. They impose limits on your behavior, but limits that you set yourself. So you yourself decide, okay, what's a reasonable amount of time for me to be spending on social media? Or that for the next hour, two hours, et cetera, I don't want to be distracted. I want to be able to actually focus on the things I'm trying to do. There's an app called Limit where you can install on your tablets and computer where you can actually set a hard limit on certain websites. Maybe you notice that you're spending way too much time on Instagram and you ask yourself, well, what's a reasonable amount of time for me to be on this every day? Beyond that, I may be harming myself, getting in the way of my ability to learn and potentially harming my opportunities in the future. So set a limit and then abide by it. Um, the beautiful thing is that you don't have to impose a limit on yourself. Once you set it, the app or the device will impose it for you. There are other fun apps. And again, these many more of these tools will be in the course we'll, we're preparing for you. Uh, one of my favorites is called Forest, where you're trying to grow a tree on your phone. And if you check your phone, the tree dies. So this tree takes half an hour to an hour to grow. And when you're sitting down to focus, you set the app to start growing your tree. And just the fact of not wanting to kill your tree makes you not check your phone during those half an hour, an hour. And the longer you focus, the more robust or tall that tree becomes. Now, I know this sounds simple, but it actually is quite effective because it's doing something that is in your interest. It's gamifying your ability to pay attention. In the same way, other apps and games, they gamify your ability to lose attention. By gamification, we mean that they make it into a game. So the more you pay attention to them, the more stars you get. You get a streak on Snapchat, the more you do it. So essentially, they're turning it into a game but the end result of that game is for you to lose your attention to this company because they make money off your attention. Apps like this do the opposite. They turn it into a game for you to reclaim your attention, for you to pay attention to the things you want to pay attention to. There is a website and a set of resources for how do you manage technology so it doesn't harm you, so it doesn't take over your life. It's called the Center for Humane Technology, and it has many suggestions. Um, I've picked up some of my favorite. Uh, one of them is to turn off notifications on your phone. Because oftentimes those notifications, they're just like Pavlov's dog. They ring us and distract us from the thing we're trying to do and they get in our way. There's no reason why you should be getting a, a bang or a, a sound or a light every time someone messages on Facebook. You can check that at your own leisure. Similarly, getting rid of apps on your phone is even better. Um, that added step of having to check them online, the behavioral barrier of having to check them online makes it more likely that you will not do it often. You only do it when you want to do it versus when the app is trying to encourage you to do it. And remember, keep your phone out at night, not in your room and definitely not beside your bed because that makes it uh, very easy for you to disrupt your sleep, which has a lot of negative effects for your learning and for your mood. All right. so. Let's say you've been a really good student. You're focusing, you've used these tools, web blockers, you're sitting there, but these apps just in the back of your head, you know you've got a notification, you know you want to check it. What do you do? You can't go cold turkey. At the end of the day, you want to stay in contact with your friends, so you can't just not check your phone. A better solution is to take breaks. Not just breaks, but structured breaks. Structured breaks are breaks that you take every so often, and you're only allowed to take them for so long, and when you come back from your break, you only focus on one thing at a time. This is called chunking. And when we use structured breaks, uh, we become much better at balancing our ability to pay attention and also to check these notifications that are weighing on our backs. One of my favorite techniques for structured breaks, this is a technique that many university students use and I use myself during my graduate studies and it's really effective. It's called the Pomodoro technique. Now, it's a fancy word, <laughs> it means tomato, it's not that fancy. It's a word for a technique that involves paying attention for 25 minutes and then taking a five minute break. That 25 minute chunk is called a Pomodoro. And the Pomodoro technique involves doing four Pomodoro chunks. So you work for 25 minutes, you take a five minute break, work for 25 minutes, take a five minute break, you do that four times and then you take a longer break. Something as simple as a Pomodoro technique can help you balance the way of the distractions with your desire to get work done in a focused manner. 
Now, there's a lot of great Pomodoro timers. You can buy physical timers. My favorite ones are apps on the computer phone that can actually do it for you. They can block distractions and give you a Pomodoro timer so you know you have to focus for the next 25 minutes. And remember the rule when it comes to uh, chunking with your studying, you do one thing at a time during a chunk. So if you're right now reading a book, you just read that book. If you suddenly have a question that you want to Google on Facebook, or you want to look up on Google, you write it down. Um, during one Pomodoro, you only do one thing. You can then devote a whole Pomodoro to answering emails, to uh, Googling questions you had. And there are many, many different Pomodoro timers. How do you use that five minute break? Do you just check your social media, go on Instagram? Sure, you can do it, it's your break. There are other things you could do that are helpful when you are uh, taking a break. And the, probably the most one is uh, doing something physical, doing something active versus just passive entertainment. For example, stretching. That's really helpful in getting back your attention, doing push-ups, um, maybe cleaning up around your room, maybe taking a breathing exercise, using one of the apps we mentioned earlier to do a five minute deep breathing exercise. Doing that once a day has immense benefit. And if you're using that between your Pomodoros, you'll definitely do it once a day. Okay, that was a lot of information. We have two more sections, and then we're going to wrap up this learning section. And remember, this was just an appetizer. You can get these resources later, and we are recording the webinar, so if you are uh, missing some of these, don't worry. We will share at least the slides and these resources to those who've signed up. How do you take notes? This is something that no one ever taught me when I was going to university, so I had to uh, learn by trial and, trial and error before I realized that there's actual methods for note-taking that we can use. I want you to introduce you to some of them today. If you're taking notes by paper, like you like to use a pen and paper, totally fine. In fact, there's some research showing that that's better for memory. There are note-taking systems that you can use. One of my favorite is called the Cornell method. In the Cornell method, as you're taking notes, you take notes on one side, and on the other side, you write keywords. What this does is it helps you to test yourself as you move forward. You leave a section at the bottom of the page, and at the end of the lesson, you summarize what you've learned. And that summarization is a great way to also test yourself. This method is really effective in helping students study, and it's one that you can learn more about and uh, research it yourself. So let's talk about what are the effective ways of doing note taking. The first is do not write things verbatim. Never copy just what you see. Always put it in your own words. That helps you really understand what you're doing, but it also helps with your memory. If you're taking books, uh, notes from a book or uh, you're reading a paragraph, first read completely, then take notes. So you can actually understand what it is that you're taking notes on so that you can take notes that are about the relevant topics versus just copying whatever you're seeing. Now, here's a good way to not only take notes, but to test yourself. After you read a paragraph, look away, ask yourself, what was the main point of this paragraph? What was it trying to tell me? Then write your notes about what you just read. Now, if you're taking notes on the computer, um, the most common method is the hierarchy method, where you use tabs to just re relate similar ideas. There is a couple of points I want you to know when it comes to taking notes on the computer. If you don't already do this, start today. Do not take notes on Microsoft Word or any word processing application. They're not meant for note taking. They're meant for printing and for publishing. There are specific tools for taking notes which are very effective. Um, one of my favorite is OneNote. It's a free application. And the way these applications are structured, it's like a physical notebook. So you have notebooks, you have sections, and you have actual pages. And unlike a physical notebook, you can move things around, you can search, and you can throw pictures, audio, and other things in a page. So learn one of these apps. And at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter which one you use, as long as you learn one and use it consistently. So OneNote is a good note-taking app. There is uh, Rome, which is a new one. Uh, Evernote, Notability, and I'm sure there are many others that you can find. Again, it's not about a specific app per se. It's about finding a note-taking app, an application that's really made to help you organize notes, learn to use it well, and then use it consistently. But having all notes in, all your notes in one place from the moment you start university makes it really easy for you to look back on the things you've learned, to prepare for examinations, and as you go through your career, to have all your thoughts organized in one place. All right, we're almost through the learning techniques. 
we're going to talk about one or two tips when it comes to how do you learn better? How do you actually memorize better as a student? The best way to memorize, and I don't mean that uh, lightly, I mean scientifically <laughs> proven, the best way to memorize information is through a technique called spaced repetition. Spaced repetition is a simple idea that you take a piece of information and you review it with a space between, and the space gets longer, the better you know the piece of information. So for example, the first time you review it, it may be after 24 hours, but if you know it the next time, you may review it after a week, after a month. Um, this method works really well when combined with flashcards. So I used to use this method when I was in university. I would have actual physical boxes where I would have flashcards. One box was materials I would review daily, weekly, monthly, bi-monthly. Now, the good news is you don't have to use physical cards and to space it out yourself. There are apps that can do this for you. One of my favorite apps that's free is called Anki. And what Anki does is that it's a digital, digital flashcard, just like a normal flashcard. You can have a question on one side, an answer on the other side. And it helps you test yourself. But also, the more you know a card, the less often you will see it. So it will space it out for you. This is also the most efficient way of learning. Another good thing about Anki and other space repetition digital flashcard systems is that you can throw in pictures, you can throw in diagrams, you can even throw in audio files for pronunciations if you're learning a language. There's another popular digital flashcard system called Quizlet. It's a website and many students use this. Ultimately, what you use is up to you. I want you to try them out to see that there are better tools out there when it comes to memorizing and to learning. Lastly, let's talk about active learning. Active learning is an idea that the best way to learn is not just passively rehearse or review what you're learning, is to engage with it. Now, why is it that you want to engage in active learning? Is because when you passively read over information, research has shown that you develop something called the illusion of competence, which is you think you know more than you actually know. And a great example of that is if I ask you right now to draw my face. Now, because you're looking at me right now, you think you know what I look like, but if I turn off my camera and ask you to draw my face, you will actually probably struggle. And that's very normal. We often think we know something because we can recognize it, but when it comes to actually reproducing it, retrieving it from our brain, we have a much tougher time. So what do you do? How do you engage in active learning? Well, here's a tip that if you use, it's going to make you a, a, a very effective student, but I'll be honest, this is hard. So that extra effort is actually what it, what, why it makes um, things last longer in your mind, why it helps you learn and retain information more. Here's a technique. When you're studying next time, instead of taking notes, write down questions. So let's say you're reading a passage about history and you're reading about Louis Riel. Instead of writing what happened to him or the date it happened, write the question that you think someone would ask you if they wanted to test your knowledge. Write down, um, who was Louis Riel? What happened to him? So even though you're reading and you're taking notes, your notes are not just copied information, they're questions. After you do this for one Pomodoro, take the next Pomodoro to go over the questions and see if you can answer them. If you can, great, write the answers on a separate sheet of paper. So you have your questions for review later before the exam. If you can't answer it, then go back and see what it is you missed, why you couldn't answer it. And again, remember, keep your questions because you can review them often and you can review them before the exam. This also allows you to have a set of questions always ready when you want to test yourself. The central principle of active learning is to constantly test yourself. The idea is this, that the proof of learning is in the testing. So as many ways as you can to find, to test yourself, your learning will improve. One example we already talked about is to write questions instead of taking notes and then try to answer those questions. Another way you can test yourself is to um, look away from a paragraph you have just read and in your head ask yourself, what was that paragraph talking about? What did I just read? One technique I like is called the page turn. As you're turning the page on a book or something you're reading, pause, hold it midway so you can't look at it and ask yourself, what was on this page I just read? If you cannot answer that question, you haven't learned. Remember, the proof of the learning is, the, the proof of the learning is in the testing. Okay, uh, on that note, thank you for engaging with some of these techniques. I wanna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Noble. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Shavosky. 
And um, so today, uh, thank you everyone for listening so far. And I'm excited today to get a chance to talk to you about some different recommendations of things that can help support students with learning disabilities in post-secondary uh, post institutions. One thing with that as well is a lot of the information I will be talking about with accessing supports is relevant to a lot of other people as well, because lots of these supports are available for everyone and a variety of different disabilities and needs, not only um, also within the areas of mental health and wellness too. Um, so as I'm going to be talking a lot about more specific stuff related to learning disabilities, I'm going to kind of look at through that lens, but also add and point out things along the way. Um, since I'm doing that, many of you might have a learning disability yourself, might know someone or have a friend, or it might be parents here with students with learning disabilities as well. So I think it's important to often um, start with seeing what's, um, I think I might not have control here. Let me see the slides. One moment. Let's see. Uh, well, what I was going to say is what we're going to start with is um, going through a little bit about what a learning disability is. And let's see, um, I'm just going to see if I can, it seems to not let me control the slides yet. Let's try this again. Okay, let's see. It seems, I don't know, Dennis, it seems to be uh, switching back. Oh, wait, now it says I'm controlling. Maybe there's just a delay. Okay. Um, so, so what we often think of a learning disability is there's a wide variety of different presentations, different features, but common one we often know is that someone with a learning disability is very smart. They have average to above average intelligence. Often what gets in the way is some sort of way how we process information. So whether it be our memory, the speed or efficiency that we process information, um, whether it be how we process sounds or um, one of these areas, one of the ways we process information in affecting our academic abilities. That's often what we think of, of a learning disability as someone who's smart that is having difficulties in some academic area. And often what we do, whether in high school, elementary, or moving on to post-secondary institutions is support, um, especially with accommodation. So as an example, some people with a reading disability might uh, benefit, uh, it might just take them longer to read information and they might benefit from having more time to read the information or they might learn best when they hear it. So having a computer that can also have it while they read along can also have it so they can listen to it and read it out loud can, can help them show what they know and show that really average to above average intelligence. Okay, so, so one thing as a side note, so I know a lot of people were asking about accommodations at college or university. Most institutions will at least provisionally accept an IEP. The most important message is to check with your institution. And we'll, I'll walk through an example of some of the important information and where to typically find it in a moment. Um, but check as soon as possible to see what accommodations is and who you need to speak to to see what you're able to, what, able, what support you're able to get. The second piece is universities. If I could interrupt uh, and, and just add, um, if you do go to get an updated assessment, so for example, both um, Dr. Roldan and myself, we do assessments for university students who will have been asked to do an updated assessment. Make sure that you have the person doing the assessment talk to your institution. Different institutions have specific requirements about what they would need in an assessment to accept that for the purposes of accommodations. Uh, apologies, Dr. Noble. Turn it back yeah, to oh, you. No problem. I, exactly. And I was going to mention with uh, check with your institution as well what requirements and what accommodations you might be able to have. Because often if you get an assessment done with a psychologist, if they haven't checked with your institution, um, point out to them that it's important to check. Or if there's certain accommodations that would be helpful and that you know you've had in high school that were helpful, let your psychologist know and see if that's stuff that they can add to the report. So, um, also check with your institution if there might be any funding available, especially through OSAP for an assessment. And uh, what's, what we mean by an assessment, just for those of you that might not understand what that means, is typically it's an assessment with a psychologist to look, either we call it a psychoeducational assessment or a psychological assessment to look at the learning profile. So similar to what I was talking about previously, we're looking at IQ and intelligence, how we process information and our academic skills and trying to see how that can inform the accommodations that might really help in post-secondary education. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through an example because I often say the word accessibility services, but that is uh, typically what it's called at a variety of different institutions. 
And really what that just means is it's just a center that can help for some sort of academic accommodations. There's often centers for social and emotional well-being as well on top of that to help get supports for students. So I'm gonna fairly quickly walk through some information with the University of Toronto, just knowing that it's one of the biggest post-secondary institutions in the GTA. But certainly afterwards, I'll talk about some information in general and some nice websites that have a variety of diff uh, different information for different post-secondary institutions. So accessibility services, what that really is referring to is support. So services for supporting learning, problem solving, and one that's not always known as inclusion as well, especially as Dr. Roldan was talking about earlier in the pandemic especially, is it's very easy to feel isolated or a lack of support. There's a lot of wonderful groups and um, different supports available for a variety of different disabilities and for people in general who are struggling academically or with any social emotional concerns. So as an example, what um, accessibility services can often provide is a variety of different supports. So accommodations, adaptive software and equipment. So potentially laptops, as I was talking about before, um, might be able to have a laptop available to you when writing a test as an example to help support your learning profile. Um, a variety of different learning strategies, lots of ones that are helpful for everyone and, and many of the ones, wonderful ones that Dr. Shavosky talked about earlier as well. And, uh, and, and again, a lot of peer support, learning and social abilities as well. Just to highlight one thing with the University of Toronto website, because they actually have some nice resources for online learning for anyone to access. So if, if anyone out there, just by clicking the student tab on that main page, you can access this next page to have a variety of different supports. So just looking at the very bottom of the page, you'll see there's a section called documents. And there are several PDFs that are great that look strategies for online learning, strategies for take home and online exams as well as a little lower there for those of you that might have assistive technology or laptops. There's some great online resources for students with disabilities and as well as some mental health strategies and resources for students. So while we're on this website, I just wanted to point that out because they're available to everyone on the internet and they're fantastic resources. Okay. So I'm not gonna walk through all the programs, but just to give you an idea of some of the things you might wanna look for just based on still with the University of Toronto website is there's a ton of wonderful programs, such as volunteer note-taking, um, there's tutoring services, um, there's services and workshops for ADHD, autism, and a variety of different uh, peer advisors and drop-in and wonderful support. So um, two that I did wanna highlight that most institutions do have, and that's definitely worth checking out, especially for those with learning disabilities or ADHD or autism who require some support as well, is different summer transition programs or transition days that might be available. Um, I used to be involved at the University of Guelph in a wonderful program where we used to have students with ADHD and learning disabilities come, um, come into the accessibility services, meet the staff, um, learn where things are, how to access materials, as well as do a lot of different interactive activities. So check these out, see if your institution has any of these because they can be a wonderful way of first getting started with your post-secondary institution. And um, sometimes they even have a lot of orientation ones like Saeed talked about earlier as well. So with services, uh, again, there's a lot of great services in your post-secondary institutions. Just to highlight a couple, I know I talked about tutoring support, you can see in the bottom right corner there. Um, but two that I did wanna point out is often accessibility services at the top there, registration and documentation requirements. So this is the type of information you really wanna look forward to seeing because it will give you information about what documentation you will need to get the accommodations that you need, especially as sometimes you can get provisional um, support with an individual education plan, but you really wanna check in advance to see what support you're able to get or whether you need an updated assessment. So just clicking on that link for the accessibility service registration and document requirements. And also another thing to point out is there's often deadlines. Um, so as you notice on the website here, the University of Toronto deadline is July 14th, 2021, which is actually approaching fairly sooner than often is expected. So checking out whether you're eligible or at least checking in with accessibility services to see what your steps or what information is needed. So as an example, most of the websites have contact information of who to ask if you're unsure. Often there'll be a section on required documentation. And just to zoom in on that a little bit more so you can see a little better, um, there's a variety of different supports for a variety of different needs, whether it's from concussions and acquired brain injuries, uh, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, different health concerns, 
mental health concerns. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, uh, whether anxiety or depression or a variety of different mental health needs. We'll talk about a little bit more later and as well as learning disabilities and um, some other disabilities too. So just um, highlighting a section, what it might look like for learning disabilities. You'll probably see a little bit more detailed information of what you need. Um, as an example, on the University of Toronto website, they're recommending here a report no older than five years or completed after the age of 18. Um, so certainly take a look, because you'll see the second line. Um, if you provide us incomplete documentation, such as only an IEP, uh, it is possible that minimal accommodations are implemented. So certainly check with as soon as you can, just to make sure you're getting the support you need. Um, and uh, especially before the deadlines, if there might be any deadlines at your post-secondary institution. Okay, so one of the things that points out is there's this wonderful website called tra transitionresourceguide.ca. So this, gu this guide here has wonderful information how to help access support in a variety of different colleges and universities in Canada. So as an example, just to show you, there's some of the colleges and universities, when you click on those icons up there, there's some wonderful tabs and, and uh, tons of different ones, not just the ones you see here. And you click on those and you see a lot more information about support from those colleges, especially guide for students with disabilities. Similarly, a lot of different universities. And just an kind of inside look, if you were to click on a university like Ryerson, opens it up and you can see there's a lot of tabs to see more general information, how to access these accessibility services that I've been talking about, different documentation might be required. So for example, if you have a learning disability, what documentation, what documentation do you need? Different support services that kind of those programs that I was going through for University of Toronto, different information about financial aid, residence, academic programs and contact information, especially as navigating a lot of this information can be overwhelming, confusing, and uh, intimidating as well. So it brings us to kind of our next point is I know I kind of went through a lot of information fairly quickly. It can feel overwhelming to have to take these steps by yourself. So certainly if you're, there's a lot of support staff here and in high school that are here to help, right? And uh, at the same time, there's a lot of support in your post uh, secondary institutions and accessibility services that are also here that can support you and help you as well, right? And of course, parents and friends. So most importantly is if you are having trouble accessing this information, ask for help. Um, certainly there's a lot of people available that can help you go through this information. Um, especially one thing that I was gonna lead into next. Is so students with learning disability, a lot of the research shows that many have elevated levels of social emotional difficulties, especially as related to the academics. So it's not uncommon to have um, elevated levels of depressive symptoms, anxiety, feelings of hopelessness, frustration, and despair. So one of the things, if you are someone out there that has a learning disability or know someone or a parent of a student with a learning disability, often need help accessing many of these different supports as well. Um, so in a lot of research that I did and others back in my time at the University of Guelph was asking students in high school, especially first year high school coming in, uh, first year university coming in from high school, is what it has it been like to be in high school? What has it been like to be in university so far having a learning disability? And one of the terms that they often report most is the idea of frustration. So it makes sense because often if you think about that definition I talked about earlier is we have a smart person, very intelligent, and something is kind of getting in the way or blocking them from showing what they know academically, kind of the definition of frustration. Um, so having these conversations with students and letting them know how to support frustration, how to find outlets. I know earlier in the presentation, there were a lot of discussion of things that can be done to help support when we're feeling um, frustrated or angry, to slow down, take a break, and take some moments, um, or, or if needed, to take some moments to talk about these with somebody. Similarly, a lot of individuals with learning disabilities sometimes feel stupid. Not that they are stupid, they just have that feeling that they're stupid because especially when we're younger, if you have a difficulty in reading and you have to read in front of others, it can be very difficult. So as an example, if you were to think something that might be hard for you, if you had to do it in front of a class full of your peers, often it doesn't make us feel very good, even if it's only related to the academic challenges. We often often sometimes see some loneliness or isolation and coming back to that, how important it is to be connected, especially with these um, summer transition programs or these tra transition days to help feel connected with other students and understand uh, 
um, especially it can help to understand and build connections with other students. Feeling different, kind of along the same level, as well as a lot of worrying about the future or potential anxiety that uh, would be helpful for have that conversation if you're a parent of a student uh, with a learning disability, if they are worrying about their future. Certainly there's a lot of individuals with learning disabilities that are highly successful and that uh, have done really wonderful things. So certainly um, sometimes worrying about the future is a common one that a lot of individuals expressed, as well as expressing a need to get rid of or fix their LD um, is, is one as well, which learning your academic profile, your learning profile and to accept that you are a person with, you're not a person defined by your learning disability, you're a person that learns differently and bringing in those accommodations helps support how you learn differently is what's important as well. Um, being teased or rejected, especially when younger and having feeling inferior to other students or fears about other students knowing that they have a learning disability. So a couple of these ones together is these can often be barriers to accessing support, um, especially in university or, or college or post-secondary institutions. There's more advocacy needed to go seek out these supports rather than compared to high school where they might have guidance counselors or special education teachers or teachers helping support the students. There is some level of seeking out the accessibility services. And um, sometimes that barrier to that can be feeling embarrassed about having a learning disability or embarrassed about uh, ADHD or whatever it may be, embarrassed having to use the accommodations themselves. So sometimes it's, it's more about having to stand out or using something like accessibility services. And I'll talk about that piece a little bit more in a moment because actually one thing that's wonderful about post-secondary ed education is often we don't stand out, um, definitely not the same way that would stand out in elementary or in high school. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna talk about this just more so quickly, but just as an overview is, so just comparing students with and without learning disabilities in, um, at the University of Guelph when I was doing research is asked a lot of different questions to see, are students with learning disabilities feeling more alienated and isolated, more anxious, angry and frustrated or embarrassed? And what a lot of my research pointed towards is especially feelings of alienation and isolation, increased levels of anxiety and stress, and just as importantly, increased levels of embarrassment that often were tied to seeking the supports or others finding out about their learning disability. Um, so these are things to keep in mind if helping support students with someone to talk to if they are feeling this way and especially supporting them and helping them get involved with accessibility services because sometimes the biggest barrier are these emotions and feelings rather than actually knowing how to use the accommodations themselves. Okay. So what it really highlights a need for is increased support and acceptance of learning disabilities as well as less feelings of shame, anxiety and isolation and frustration um, and helping to make sure that the students feel supported. And so how to get that support is, oh, actually I'll come to that in one moment. Uh, I did, I did wanna check one thing with university compared to high school is that, um, so often if we ask students earlier in, in my master's research, I looked at high school students and university students just to see how they describe the experience. And often what is reported is there's less negativity being used to describe university compared to high school and an increase in positivity which is wonderful to see because often students as as they get these accommodations as they go into fields they really prosper thrive and see more determination and um, really are very successful in university so it's, it's and, and I should say to all these students also were accessing support so it really speaks to the importance of getting support in university as well okay and then so how to get that support so a quick Google or a quick search of any mental health or wellness support from a variety of institutions. So as an example of just looking through George Brown's website and counseling or mental health support, there's a bunch of different programs that are available to help get, gain support there, whether it's through support through peers or more counseling or mental health support. Similarly, a quick Google for something like Humber, you can see information about virtual appointments for support, different resource centers, such as ones for LGBTQ+. Um, a autism spectrum disorder, social groups, uh, managing emotions, different ones for stressful times. And similarly, as, the, as we were talking about University of Toronto for, before, has a wide variety of different groups um, to help build positive mental health and breathing and coping, self-compassion, as well as different community support groups, exam prep and text, uh, test anxiety, which is I know 
something that can be very helpful for students as well. And um, as well as I know, I mentioned a lot of about sleep advice. Um, and uh, I know I know some people also. I don't know. Uh, sometimes often feel heading into university different uh, imposter syndrome type kind of feelings, as well as there's some nice support groups there too. Sometimes at your post secondary institutions. Okay, and certainly with the next step, as I was talking about earlier, if you're having any difficulty, ask your guidance counselors, your special education teachers, your teachers, your administration principals, vice principals, parents, friends, maybe you know another student who's going to the same institution that you're now being enrolled in. And certainly check out some of these websites that can be really helpful for getting set up with uh, the information that you need to connect with accessibility services or learning services or um, these mental health centers within the schools as well. Similarly, your high schools also do have psychology staff and social workers as well that can be requested if you need support uh, as well, especially on the emotional side too, because this is a really difficult system to navigate. And uh, yeah, so, so really mostly just to let people know following the presentation, there will be a resource page. I'll be emailed out with the different resources as well as the survey and any interest in any future presentations. And um, just note as well that any email volume that may be, may be unable to respond right away, but we'll try our best to get back to you as well. Okay, I think that goes, takes us to the questions. I just jump in quickly, guys, just to jump in really quickly, just to practice a little bit of space retrieval that Dr. Shavoshi had talked about, just because the, the last bit of doc, what Dr. Noble talked about, you know, I would really encourage you guys as you make decisions as to what your next steps are, not only is, uh, as Dr. Noble said, the first thing is you're reaching out to accessibility services to find out what is required for you or how you can get supports, but also to look into what your tuition covers, right? And what is actually covered with the tuition, what sort of supports are in place so that you're not so, um, ner if you need it when, once you're there, you're, start, you're going to have that information prior to. Uh, look into what coverage, you know, what, you know, you might have some health coverage even with your tuition as well. So you want to uh, explore those options and ensure that you're, uh, you have all the information you need um, in, 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 in based on what, what is covered with tuition. So I really do encourage that, read up on it and, and uh, educate yourself on what the tuition covers. If I could add to that, Dr. Rolden, so once you start at a post-secondary institution, let's say university or college, they have a mental health center, okay? counseling and accessibility services. The services offered by the university on campus will be available to you with no additional charge. So your tuition, which is the money you paid for enrollment and taking courses, covers that. As a student, you also get additional health insurance. Most universities and colleges enroll you in some sort of a health insurance policy. That may give you farther uh, coverage if you want to see a psychologist or a psychotherapist or a social worker outside of the university. So I think it's important for you to know there were a number of questions about tuition and what it covers is that the services we spoke about, especially the services Dr. Noble spoke about with regards to accessibility services, they are available to you at no additional charge. And that's why that's a really good place to start. And they can even refer you to other services outside if that's what you need. All right, so let's, uh, uh, Dr. Noble, if you still control the screen, let's go to the last slide. And uh, let, let's take a few moments to highlight some of the key points of the presentation. And if you have any questions, now will be the time. Otherwise, we're going to wrap up early for today and make sure that we can get you the resources um, uh, that we spoke about during today's presentation. Um, I'll start with uh, Dr. Roland. Dr. Roland, if I could just, if there was one walkaway point uh, from you, your segment, what yeah. do you want to walk away with? Honestly, for me, it's just it's just about opening up that conversation. As a you know, in a lot of the work that we do is also with parents. Um, and, and if there's parents in the audience, I would be uh, really trying to emphasize the idea of, of of mindful parenting. And what is mindful parenting? The way I view mindful parenting is recognizing um, sort of your uh, what's driving your choices, right? So if you're young, if you're a parent of a young child and they're having a meltdown, are you acting because you're worried about what other people are thinking about your child's meltdown and that impacts how you behave? Now that you're dealing with teenagers, I would encourage you to be the same way of thinking of what is it that I'm, that is that is uh, motivating my, my behavior towards my children. And so that's why I started with the conversation about opening up the conversation. 
provide an invitation to your youth about, about being able to have these conversations that are difficult and challenging. And I would encourage you to try, and even though it might be difficult or, or a challenge, or you're worried about how they're gonna respond, many times, even though a child might be resist, or, or a youth might be resistant at the beginning, just the fact that you're opening the door can lead, you know, can, can contribute to changes later down, down the road. So again, just open to, the, to those conversations, being open to the difficult emotions that are related to the pandemic and this tr transition period. Thank you. And if I could summarize my section, I would say that um, approach your learning like a craft, like an art. When you first pick up an instrument, let's say like the violin, you don't expect yourself to be good at it. You learn how to practice better, how to get better at it. Learning is like that. We can learn techniques to learn better. We can become a better learner, a better student by investing time and energy into techniques and tools that can help us be a better learner. So if, especially during the summer, if you have uh, a gap between now and when you start in September, probably the best way to start for university is not to review any content per se. So not reviewing your algebra or your chemistry is to actually take time get a book, get some resources, watch some YouTube videos on how you can be a better student. And Dr. Noble, if I could turn it to you to wrap up the, the webinar. <laughs> yeah, so I think just echoing that and, and what's most important is reaching out to un universities, colleges, or post-secondary institutions as soon as possible, or at least take the websites to see if there's any deadlines for getting set up with accessibility services, how to do it. And if you're not sure how to do it, ask for help as soon as you can especially before the school year ends, so you can help get set up and not miss anything that might have been offered in the summer or there, or had a deadline in the summer as well. Um, especially as I know lots of talk highlighted about information about learning disabilities, but to, as an example for many people with ADHD or learning disabilities, even reading and accessing and planning and organizing that's involved to get through this information can be very difficult. So if you are someone that has difficulty with that, ask for help, oh, whether it be someone at the school or at home or a friend, as just um, ask someone to see if, if they can help support you get set up with accessibility services. Uh, just looking at some of the questions that are coming in just about assessments, I would encourage you, you maybe reach out to us and, and let us know what sort of area of the city you're in and we can sort of provide you a list of individual uh, places that you may want to check. Honestly, there, there, there are more clinics than you probably know about. So, you know, you might be getting some no's about uh, doing a, a reassessment, but there are going to be clinics that are that likely have some availability over the summer. And so, again, if you if you send us a um, an email or, or contact us, maybe we'll provide a, like an email at some. Uh, at a certain point, we can try and help you depending on where you are in the city and give you a list of, of, of potential assessors. I would also add that, uh, as uh, Dr. Noah mentioned, uh, you will have some provisional accommodation. So as long as you start a conversation with the accessibility services, uh, you, they, you will have time to get that reassessment and they will even let you know if you need it. So uh, perhaps uh, take a step back and first connect with the institution, see what they say, and then pursue a, a reassessment. There is no need to panic about that right now. Yeah, and sorry, there's a question there about transitioning to college and then university. Listen, uh, you know, you know, what's one of the things that's that is amazing is how much uh, that 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 bridge has has improved since I was in university. And now there's so many programs that have a nice uh, segue from college right into university. So I would say that's a very valuable and and great uh, approach to take if you want to go into a college program uh, for a year or two and then transition into university. It's much easier to do than it used to be. So I would, I would definitely encourage that. Um, there was a question about what's the difference between a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Arts. It really is just about the courses you take. There's no uh, huge difference between bo uh, both. They will both have a certain amount of requirements, most more or less equivalent in terms of the workload. Um, and uh, it, it really it pursue the field of study that you think is most of interest and useful to you. So two, two things to answer. Kevin, did you want to say something? Sorry. No, no, I was just trying to read the questions. Yeah, so, so one, the 2013 is probably going to be a little bit too old. Again, we encourage you to contact the institution just to make sure, just to be safe. Um, and then in terms of universities, some universities, depending, will have their own staff to do assessments, but not always. So like as Dr. Shavoshi has said repeatedly, there may be time, ways to get, uh, institutions will have their own assessors, a list of assessors, that they have a, a relationship with. And so you may wanna have that conversation and see if they have anyone that they can offer. Um, but most of the time you're, you're, you will have to find somebody um, uh, externally, but again, you can, they can guide you a little bit with that as well.
Yeah, and they'll let you know exactly what you need. And then often, like even if I think there was a question about an older assessment in like 2013 or something like that, often uh, they, they can uh, allow some accommodations or checking to see in the meantime, right? Um, before you can get an updated assessment. Checking with them as soon as you can to see what they're able to do at the specific post-secondary institution. And one last thing, you know, I see some of these questions in, that are coming in. And one thing I will say, because we, again, the three of us work with youth all the time, right? And one of the most prevailing issues we see is the pressure that kids like yourselves put on, on, on yourselves, right? You think that this is going to make or break your life, this next phase. Listen, it is important, but I can guarantee you that doors that aren't open right now don't necessarily mean they will stay closed. And so one of the things about, about being open to, to the emotional part is also being open to some of the disappointments that are gonna come your way because they come, they come for all of us. You know, I went to, a, I did a four year university degree that I did nothing with. I did nothing with my degree and, and, and I ended up getting my PhD. And so again, I use my example uh, just to, to let you guys know that if you, if you do find some of those challenges as you get into university or college or wherever you go, that it's always about trying to figure out how you can sort of get up from those, those moments. And I really do encourage you to be open to when you're having those difficult moments, acknowledge that they're having, find resources, find supports, connect with others, and, 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 we can, and you can sort of try and get through those moments. There's a question about textbooks to prepare ahead. Um, you sound like a very keen student, so that's wonderful. I would say don't do that. That's, that's not the way to prepare ahead by memorizing textbook you use in first year. The best way to prepare ahead is by learning how to be a better student, so learning about study techniques. And second, reviewing some of the foundational knowledge that you'll need throughout your career. That foundational knowledge will be things like reading, writing, vocabulary. And uh, if you are going to a STEM field, it will be basic mathematic, biology, and chemistry knowledge. Um, again, the content will differ based on the course you're in. It's best not to prepare for specific content, but to learn how to have a better strategy overall. Yeah, I think we've answered most of them. Yes, we are going through the questions. Um, how can I bridge to university from college? There are actual programs that are bridge programs. So I know, for example, that uh, I believe Dr. Roland Humber offers one, Seneca offers one. I used to actually be a professor at Seneca in their university transition program. And the way it works is that you do two years at Seneca College, two years at York University, and you graduate with a university degree. So there are specific programs for the, uh, called transition programs. I would ask you to look into them. If you're not in a specific program, you can still transition. You may just not be able to carry over as many credits. So you may end up doing an additional year or an additional summer. So I think we've addressed most of the questions that were relevant uh, to us to the presentation. There were some questions about specific programs and the course requirements. Uh, those would be wonderful questions to ask your guidance counselor who can help you with specific pro program entry requirements, grades you may need, and the application process through OAC, which many of you would have already gone through. So again, please make an appointment with your local high school guidance counselor. Um, Again, there are questions about whether you need to take a specific course like physics for entering a, a university program in psychology. Those are questions best answered by your guidance counselor because they can sit down with you and help you notice what the requirements for each program are. They will be different and those requirements would be addressed through OAC, which is the application submission portal. Um, okay, I, I think we've addressed most of the questions and uh, uh, on that note, I'm going to wrap up the webinar. Um, Dr. Roland and uh, Dr. Noble, who we lost momentarily, it's been a pleasure. And uh, again, I encourage you to uh, send us an email if you have any questions that we haven't addressed. We will try to get to it, but of course, there's a large email volume at this time. And uh, we hope to share with you additional resources and materials uh, following this webinar, and we'll let you know when the recording is available. On that note, I'm going to say bye on behalf of our panel. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone.